This program is a presentation of UCTV for educational and non-commercial use only. Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Science at the Theater, sponsored by the Friends of Berkeley Lab and co-sponsored by the Berkeley Energy Resources Collaborative. My name is Jeff Miller, and I'm head of public affairs at Berkeley Lab. Uh, we are very excited by our fall Science at the Theater series, which we are calling Get Smart About Carbon. And in planning tonight's theme, Trading Carbon, Can Cook Stoves Light the Way, we had you all in mind. We know that there is a lot of confusion in the intellectual marketplace as rival ideas about carbon compete for your attention and allegiance. For example, the term carbon footprint yields more than 8 million results on a Google search. Carbon trading, nearly 6 million. By comparison, a search on Lady Gaga brings us 181 million results, which is perhaps a problem of a different kind. Uh, that said, uh, we want you to come away from our three conversations this fall, about conversations about carbon, with a greater sense of what you can do to participate in the climate solution. That's how we frame these. Berkeley Lab may be on a hill, but it has a very down-home populist mission, which is to find technological solutions to some of the world's most urgent problems, as well as provide answers to some of humanity's biggest questions about the cosmos. The science does not exist in a popular vacuum, uh, it has to be relevant to uh, steal a term from the 60s lexicon. And we hope that as tonight proceeds, you will understand just how relevant cook stoves and cook stove science has become in battling in one of the biggest climate issues of our time. Our speakers tonight are Ashok Gadgil, Director of Berkeley Lab's Environmental Energy Technologies Division. Adam Rausch and Kaja Booker are both participating guest researchers in the lab's EETD division and doctoral students at UC Berkeley. Uh, now, before we bring Ashok onto the stage, uh, it's time to get out your cell phones. You're allowed to do that now. We're going to have a little voting session. Uh, and here is tonight's first question. So you need to text in, call in at uh, 22333. Get out your cell phones. So do you know what carbon trading is? Now, please be honest. If you know, then you punch in one, two, three, eight, two, seven. If you don't really know what it is, and that's okay, one, two, three, eight, two, six. Now we're gonna have to wait maybe 20, 30 seconds for these to start registering. So if you know any Lady Gaga jokes, I guess we can just wait. If you don't have a cell phone, you're gonna have to uh, well, you can raise your hands, I guess, when we get to that point, and we'll, we'll just look. Are you kidding me? Okay. Now that's more like it. Come on. This is, I know this is Berkeley, but really? Well, I guess you don't have to stay for the presentation if you already know what it is. Okay, it's bouncing around. Okay, well, this is a very smart audience. You'll be smarter, I guarantee you, before the evening's over. So let's welcome Michelle Gadgill as our first speaker. Thanks very much, Jeff. So before we start, it's worthwhile to ask the question, what do the the poorer five billion people on the planet really care for, because that's going to drive the issue of what do they want and whether they are willing to reduce their carbon emissions or not. So in fact, it turns out we don't have to poke around to answer the question and worry about whether we are being culturally arrogant and expect our norms to be imposed on people at the bottom of the economic pyramid, well, it's a big bottom, five, five billion. The UN did that for us. The UN convened uh, experts from the developing countries, from middle income countries, 
and ask them what are the goals and what are the objectives of, of developmental effort. And they constructed an index, the, the Human Development Index, HDI, which is a quantitative measure of human well-being, and it can be disaggregated country-wide. Uh, it incorporates three different indices, and each of those three indices, the economic well-being or prosperity, and health, life expectancy, public health, and health care, and literacy and education, each one of them is further unpacked into several measures, and all of these come together into these three, and then they are put together into a single number called the HDI. And the UN publishes, United Nations publishes the HDI values for every country in the world. Uh, and it ranges from a possible minimum of zero and a possible maximum of one. And every country maps on there, and that gives, a, gives an indication of what's the quality of life. So if we were to see what is the quality of life, this map shows you the HDI by world map with 0.95 and over countries shown as dark green, basically North America, Australia, New Zealand, Japan, uh, and Western Europe. And all the way down, you get to 0.35 and 399, which almost looks black, and I think there's just one country there. Uh, but five billion people live here, rest of the world, okay? And that's what, that's what, they, uh, what they're aspiring for. So the surprise, of course, is that HDI is very closely related to energy consumption, to modern energy consumption. And just as one aspect of, or, or, or a dominant aspect, let's look at how HDI ties um, to electricity consumption, per capita electricity consumption. And we can plot per capita electricity consumption on the horizontal axis in kilowatt hours per person versus human development index on the vertical axis. And uh, you would see all the countries below the yellow band, you see this light yellow band, I should have made it darker. All the countries below the yellow band are the five billion people here, okay? There's a huge crowd of countries there which adds up in fact to the five billion. And then the yellow band is the one billion people and the top band is under billion people. This is round numbers. The world population is 6.8 billion, but I'm rounding that off to, to seven and giving you five plus one plus one in round numbers. The key point to notice here is that all these countries are crowded here with, with low HDI. They're crowded near the low values for electricity consumption, which is right down there. And then you have countries running all the way to Norway with 25,000 kilowatt hours per person. United States is here at 12,500, and California is here at 7,500, okay? We are close to France. Uh, and that's because California is very energy efficient compared to the rest of the United States, though we could do a lot better than we currently do. These are annual trajectories now. Again, it is, now this is GDP per capita in purchasing power parity. Year to, in $2,000, so it's corrected for inflation. And this is CO2 emissions per capita. And we are at the, the high end, not so good, okay? Our CO2 emissions are about 20 tons of CO2 per capita. That's what you and I on the average emit every year, and that's huge. The world average is five. And these two giants, 1.2 billion each, China and India, are sitting down there, way below, in the corner. And their aspiration and, and their vision and their dreams are to become like us, right? Whereas in reality, what we need to do to manage carbon is actually bring our emissions down to some level like that. We need a huge reduction rather than their huge increase. So the real challenge is, which of these two trajectories are they going to follow? Are they going to follow the red trajectory, which is where US went, or will they follow a low energy development path and maybe land up here as they get more and more prosperous? That remains to be settled and the fate of the world hangs on that among many other important questions. So here's a map of the world 
showing you population density. Obviously, the high density regions, China, India, Western Europe, some parts up there, you know, some parts in Africa here, Indonesia, you would see these are, these are the places where people live. And now we can look at the same map, looking at a composite images taken by satellites of the night time view of the Earth. And that is a surrogate for electricity consumption. Because when people have electricity consumption, they turn on their lights, and the satellites from the sky can see them illuminating the dark Earth. And here is that picture. Okay, So you see brightly lit northern uh, eastern seaboard of the United States. You see Western Europe. You see brilliantly lit Japan. You see a few cities in Australia. Uh, you know, the big masses here are essentially completely black. You don't see any light leaking out. Uh, you see a little bit of India, but you don't see much of China. So if we were to see what would happen if all these populations that you saw from the previous slide were to light up like the populations they want to be like. They want to be like Western Europe and United States. You can superpose these maps on each other. And this is what you get to see, okay? You would see this mass here, unlit mass in Africa. You see unlit masses in China and India. And when they turn on their lights to become like this and that, that's what we are dealing with. Of course, we hope that when they turn on their lights, they'll be turning on compact fluorescent lamps and not incandescent lamps. But we'll see, that's, that's a bridge we have to cross, okay? So developing countries' position in climate negotiations has been quite a forceful and ethically grounded point of argument. They say that the world's atmosphere, the planet's atmosphere, is a global commons. That is to say, no particular country can lay a claim to the, to the world's atmosphere. And there is little headroom left for adding any more CO2. We ought to be at about you know, 280 ppm of CO2. We are already at 385 plus, and there is not much room to grow. And they say they too have a right to improve their livelihoods, and they didn't put most of the CO2 that is out there. So they're asking, what about us? What are you going to, are you going to ask us to stay poor and in, in poverty forever? That's, that's the question. So one illustrative answer about which we are going to talk here is fuel efficient cook stoves for the poorest two billion people on the planet. These are biomass cook stoves. The reason we call them biomass rather than fuel wood is because lots of people are so poor they don't even use fuel wood. They use twigs, they use uh, sticks like, like this woman. None of this wood is something that will qualify for fuel wood in a safe way. Uh, we have to buy fuel food from Safeway. Okay. Uh, this is what she collects every other day. She's a woman from a Darfur refugee camp. And that's the kind of uh, wood we are talking about. So that's a, the idea, biomass. And these people cook on solid fuels, mostly with stoves of very low efficiency. A typical stove of low efficiency is here. This is a three stone fire. Literally, there are three stones. They support a pot, and you light fire under the, in the space under the pot, and that's a three-stone fire. So almost all of the two billion people who cook uh, on biomass, they cook on these simple three-stone fires or with some homemade clay stoves, generally of very low efficiency, because that's been the tradition for centuries. And these biomass stoves emit soot, or what is called black carbon. Black carbon has a, is a very potent driver for global climate change, for radiative forcing, for, for, for warming the planet. It is the second strongest man-made uh, greenhouse agent right after CO2. But there's one nice catch to it. It's in our favor. CO2 molecules, once emitted, stay in the atmosphere for about 100 years which means if you stop emitting CO2 today, 
all the CO2 that is accumulated in the atmosphere is not going to go away for another 100 years. And we are not going to stop emitting CO2 today anyways. With soot, it's a lot easier to stop emitting soot by making the biomass stoves more efficient. And soot has a lifetime of only about four to six weeks. That's it. So if you were to take soot production out, the atmosphere will rapidly clear of the soot. And this is a prediction made by Ramanathan and colleagues saying if you were to stop the emissions from burning fossil fuels and cooking with wood, dung, and crop residues from India and China, this is what's happening today. And this is what, thus, this is what would happen if you only take out cooking with wood, crop, and dung projected, projected uh, calculation, if you take out all the soot. So the clearance of the atmosphere is very rapid for black soot. And this is one of the rapid things that we can do. And of the second most powerful human-generated greenhouse agent in the atmosphere. So we started working on fuel-efficient stoves in back in 2005 in response to the humanitarian crisis in Darfur. This stove cost about $25 and saves $250 per year of fuel wood to the Darfur refugee woman and it lasts five years. It also saves about two tons of CO2 emissions per year that is in use, so about 10 tons worth. 2008, World Vision approached us, having heard of our work in Darfur, saying next doors to Sudan, which is where Darfur is, is Ethiopia. And World Vision is one of the largest charities in the world. They said, look, Ethiopia is, is in bad shape because it's got a big population, 84 million people. The forest cover, which used to be 35% in the middle of last century, has gone down to about 3%. And still 80% of the people rely on fuel wood and twigs and branches for cooking their meals. So their back is to the wall. Is there something you could do to adopt the stove developed for Darfur in Sudan to apply that to Ethiopian conditions so that it would be a very cost-effective thing to do. You don't have the kind of extreme humanitarian crisis in, in uh, Ethiopia at the moment, but this is something we can propagate and, and implement rapidly. So can LBNL develop a better stove for Ethiopia? That is a question they asked. So we visited Ethiopia. This is a photograph of what it looks like in the countryside. The stones in the field tell you that this is not an agricultural landscape. It is just denuded countryside. You see this as you drive hours and hours and hours into the countryside. There is not a tree left standing, but it's not even agricultural land. It's just bare, barren fields with stones and stubble grass. We visited there and visited a number of households. We studied what pots they use, what food they cook, what fuel they use, Here's a woman cooking on an Ethiopian woman, cooking on a three stone fire equivalent. In Ethiopia, we found they don't use actually stones. They use these columns, which are made out of baked uh, earth. So effectively, here is one, here is a second column, third one is behind. Here is a pot, a flat bottom pot sitting on the fire, and this is how they cook. So we said, let's, let's see what we can do. So we got from there actually, uh, the full set of Ethiopian parts. We studied what they cook, how they cook, how much food in per, per meal, and so on. And now I'll hand it off to Adam to tell you the story of what we actually did. One of the principal tenets of our group has that been that we seek to understand and respond to the needs specific to each group of people we're working with. For example, these two images are very similar. At left, we have a Sudanese woman preparing a meal. At right, an Ethiopian woman is doing the same. But it's important to note that they're cooking different foods in different pots via different cooking methods using different utensils. You might notice the, the Sudanese woman is cooking outdoors, while the Ethiopian woman is in her home. Or that the Sudanese stir stick 
is over twice as long. And that may seem trivial, but when the Sudanese women cook a sita, one of two principal staples, they stand above the pot and stir so rigorously that the Darfur designs required holes so the stoves could be staked into the ground. When you add up differences like this, it means that the women involved have different needs and that we are willing and even enthusiastic about addressing these needs individually. It's one of the principal reasons World Vision was so enthusiastic to work with us. If we're going to address these needs, we need to bring a solution that is both technically and culturally viable. Technical compatibility means that our stove works with their pots. It means that it reduces emissions and improves efficiency when used with their cooking methods. At the left, you can see a pot that's clearly too large for the stove. This is an example of a technical incompatibility. Fortunately, the pot is only used on holidays. At the right is the Yushang stove. This is another stove that's being tested in Ethiopia, and it shows an example of a cultural incompatibility. The Yushang comes with a metal skirt. You can see this just up here. And it sits above the stove, focuses the heat into the pot, and makes the system as a whole substantially more efficient. Unfortunately, this is a very rare picture because when we went to the households, when we saw a Yusheng stove, we found the skirts discarded in the corner or not to be found at all. So we asked them about it. They said it was difficult to use, difficult to adjust, and the benefits that it offers aren't readily apparent. Unfortunately, without the skirt, it's substantially less efficient. And so any carbon they were expecting to save was literally going right out the window. The bottom line is this. If there's something about our stove that they don't like, they're not going to use it. And if our stove sits idle in the corner, then we're doing nothing to reduce CO2. So based on what we'd learned and the pots we'd brought back, we developed three prototype stoves. The principal difference has to do with the pots that we were wanting to accommodate. The Darfur design is built to accommodate either of two round bottom pots. You can see over there. And the pots that we brought back from Ethiopia were flat bottomed. So in both cases, the pots are supported by metal rods, which are shown in red in each of these. But these rod patterns allowed for a wider variety of pots to be supported. There were also changes to the collar, which is this uppermost part here, and the firebox, which is this blue section. And those were principally for safety and thermodynamic concerns. So in January, a colleague and I traveled to Yaya Gulele in Ethiopia. We brought these stoves into the homes. We spoke with the women there, invited them to cook a meal on one of our prototypes, solicited feedback, and this is what we learned. Women in that area roast coffee several times a day. They actually roast the beans, pound them into grains, and brew them all in a single setting, sitting. What we found, however, is that the roasting trays vary in size. And for those trays, like this one, they can fit down inside our pot down inside our stove. It's trivial to set the tray inside the stove. It's trivial to add the beans, but it's exceptionally difficult to remove the tray once hot without either risking burns or spilling the beans into the fire. So this was probably our largest technical incompatibility. Our largest cultural incompatibility concerned the ash that's created by these fires. In Darfur, the ash would fall with charred embers onto the ground, and it hadn't been much of an issue because the Darfuri women cook outdoors. But as you'll recall, the Ethiopian women cook in their homes. Still, because they have bare earth floors, we hadn't given the ash much consideration. 
we didn't understand how important it was to them to keep those floors tidy until one of the women told our translator, it burned my house. So that was our wake up call. That night, I stayed up in the hotel room and built a makeshift ash pan we used in subsequent trials. And we've absolutely included one ever since. So we can see here is ash on the ground. That was from one meal being cooked on the stove. And just behind the stove on the right here, we can see this is the ash pan that I made in the field. Now, these certainly weren't the only issues that we encountered. Do you recall we brought back a set of pots from Ethiopia and based our designs around those? The reality was not quite so simple. In Darfur, all women seemed to use basically the same two pots. But in Ethiopia, we found a wider variety. The households were comparatively wealthy. They might have four or five or six pots each with very little consistency house to house. And while we did find pots like those we'd purchased at the market in Addis, we also found smaller pots, larger pots, round bottom vessels, and clay kettles. To make a long story short, only two of our designs proved sufficiently versatile to deal with all of these pots. So we worked from those two designs, along with all of the other information we gathered on our second trip, to come up with a pilot design. The pilot design has four rods, you can see here, to support the pots. And it supports a wide variety of pots with stability and without causing rocking. It has a larger ash pan, which is underneath the stove in both images. So that triangular fixture here. It has stronger handles and it has triangular tabs, which keep larger pots from sealing off the airflow. Finally, it includes a large coffee roasting tray, big enough to sit above the stove completely. Once we had a pilot design, we began testing the stoves for efficiency. There are several different efficiency standards that one can use, ranging from general to situation specific, based on two key trade-offs. First, a water boiling test measures the fuel and time required to bring a set amount of water to a boil twice and then to simmer it for 45 minutes. It's very general and hence universally comparable between all stoves. But the downside is it doesn't aim to replicate any specific cooking practices. By comparison, a controlled cooking test aims to replicate a specific cook task. The cook task is chosen based on the region and the culture, and it's meant to mimic the cook practices that are done locally. So a sida or moa in Darfur, or wat in Ethiopia. It may prove a better indicator of how your stove will actually interact with, with the cooks in that location, but the downside is, is it's no longer comparable. You can't compare results from a controlled cooking test from Darfur to Ethiopia to Haiti to Mexico, et cetera. The second trade-off involves testing location and separates the kitchen performance test, which is where the cooking is done by cooks within their own kitchens, with the other two, where the cooking is done by researchers in lab settings. So the kitchen performance test probably offers the best chance to assess the impact of a possible intervention. But the downside is it's costly, it's time consuming, and being outside of laboratory controls means that you introduce a whole host of other variables. So to get the whole picture for efficiency, you really need to be looking at all of these. We've recently considered the first completed the first of these, the water boiling test for the Ethiopia stoves. And I'm presenting a few of the results from that, along with other stoves that are being tested and piloted in Ethiopia. So from left to right, we have the Berkeley Ethiopia stove. This is our guy here. Then an EnviroFit model. These, this is the Yusheng stove, tested with the skirt properly in place. This is the Tiki Kiel stove which is produced locally in Ethiopia. And at the far right, we have a traditional three-stone fire. 
The first point I want to make is that all the stoves prove substantially more efficient than the traditional fires. This is what we'd expect. But you can see here these efficiencies are about 10% for the traditional fire, and they're above 20 for everything else. Further, our stove proves slightly more efficient for the boiling phase, that's the 27 number, and substantially more efficient for the simmer phase at 42. The downside is that our stove took longer to boil than any of the other options. So in a nutshell, our option is slower but more efficient. The other side of testing stoves is emissions. This is our laboratory setup for testing emissions. The apparatus is seen here. You can, this fire is tended underneath this metal box. Hot gases flow up through the ductwork where they are uh, mixed, sampled, and sent to various instruments. We have, in this apparatus, completed tests for the Darfur stove and for open three stone fires, measuring carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, various particulates, which are relevant for health reasons and other things, as well as black carbon, which is the soot uh, Ashok was mentioning. Likewise, this sort of testing is going to be a crucial step for the Ethiopia program, because it's going to allow us to quantify both our greenhouse impact in general and our CO2 reductions in particular. And with that, I will turn it over to Keja Booker. Thank you, Adam. So my name is Keja, and I'm going to be introducing a few of the basic concepts that lie behind carbon credits, both generally and specifically as they relate to fuel-efficient wood-burning cookstoves like the Berkeley Darfur stove, and also talking a little bit about how we use carbon funding to finance these types of projects. So first I'm going to start with a little bit of background about carbon and cookstoves. Um, it's useful to think about carbon as existing in several different pools. So carbon is in soils, it's in the ocean, it's in plants, it's in the atmosphere, and it's constantly moving between all of these different pools through various mechanisms. What we care about for climate change is when these transfers become unequal, specifically when more carbon dioxide is admitted to the atmosphere than is absorbed by the terrestrial systems. So in this first scenario that I've got here, this is a mature forest with no human use. You can see by these arrows that it is absorbing carbon dioxide through photosynthesis, but it's also releasing carbon dioxide through decay and through respiration. However, in this mature forest situation, these are pretty well balanced. There is no net transfer to the atmosphere. And in fact, most mature forests have some sink capacity, meaning that they absorb more carbon dioxide from the atmosphere than they emit. The second scenario, we've added in human use, but at a very low sustainable level. So you see here we have the three stone open fire that Ashok was talking about, but the emissions from this fire are essentially balanced out by regrowth in the forest. They're harvesting at a low enough level that trees are regrowing and essentially recapturing the emissions from these cook stoves. Also, the fuel that they're collecting from the forest is likely deadfall. It's things that were already going to decay anyway. So these, the system is really in balance. And in carbon policy, what we call this is a renewable biomass system. And in a renewable biomass system, you're, you can't get credit for carbon dioxide emission reductions because these emissions are not contributing to climate change. So in reducing them, you don't actually get a carbon credit. I should add, though, that there's still a large climate benefit, even if we replace this with our cook stoves, even if we can't claim the carbon dioxide, we're still impacting the climate through reducing carbon dioxide, methane, and the black carbon that Ashok was talking about. But as far as carbon dioxide, you don't get the credit. So most carbon cookstove projects are focusing on this third scenario, and I would definitely say that our Ethiopia project falls into this category. So here what we have is very heavy use in the forest. Uh, the capacity of the forest to absorb carbon dioxide is severely diminished because of deforestation. 
and the emissions from these three stone fires are so large that they can't be recaptured. So these red arrows represent net increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide. And with our cook stoves, if we replace those and thereby decrease the amount of wood that is used and the emissions that comes from burning that wood, we're actually impacting the carbon dioxide climate effect and we get a credit from that climate, from that carbon dioxide emission reduction. So how do we calculate this? How do we, what, what amount are we talking about here? Ashok told you that it's about two tons. And to put that in perspective, uh, an average US passenger car emits about five tons of carbon dioxide per year. So two and a half of our stoves offsets the emission of one passenger car in the US. Or another way to think about it is that the average American emits 20 tons of carbon dioxide. So 10 of our stoves would emit, would offset the emissions of a single American. So when you talk about it like that, it sounds pretty puny. This isn't really making a huge impact. But when we do these stove projects, they're very, very large. So our Ethiopia project, we're talking about 100,000 cook stoves, which is 40,000 cars off the road or offsetting the emission of 10,000 Americans. So when you scale these projects up, and as was noted previously, there's a huge demand. There's billions of people that need these cook stoves. When you get onto that large scale, you're talking about a really significant climate effect. So how do we calculate a carbon credit? We start out by calculating the emissions baseline, which we do by calculating the emissions in absence of the project. In this case, the three stone fires. So Adam talked a little bit about how we do this testing in the lab and out in the field. Um, basically, for most carbon projects, this is, they do the kitchen performance test that he was mentioning. So they send a team of researchers out into Ethiopian households. People watch as they cook. They measure all the wood that they take in and that they use for cooking over a certain amount of time. Then what we do is in a certain sample of those households, we replace those three stone fires with our cook stoves and do the same thing all over again. We watch them cook, we measure the wood, and the difference between the emissions with our cook stoves and with the three stone fires is the carbon savings, which is what generates the carbon credit. And one carbon credit is one metric ton of carbon dioxide, always. So that's kind of a key idea is that uh, these credits are equivalent. No matter where they're produced, no matter how they're produced, one carbon credit is always one metric ton of carbon dioxide. And that's important because it's only through that reason that these are transferable. And this is because carbon dioxide is a well-mixed atmospheric gas. So no matter where these things happen or how they're produced, it has the same impact on climate change. And while the impacts are the same, the costs are very different. And I know that this slide is hard to read, but uh, the words aren't important. It's more the trend here. This is a cost curve of carbon abatement. So it's how much it costs to reduce, to eliminate one ton of carbon dioxide emissions. And it starts, it's organized by cost. So it starts here on this side with the very lowest, cheapest things that are so cheap they actually save you money. So this is mostly insulation efficiency sort of things. And it goes up to here where you're getting around, it costs around $50 to save a ton of carbon dioxide. And actually they just stop this right here. This could keep going up into more and more expensive things. So the effect is the same, but the cost is different. And that leads you to the idea that maybe it's the most efficient thing to do to start with these cheap options. And that is what the carbon market is supposed to do. So the carbon market allows those for whom it's very expensive to reduce to pay people for who it's cheaper to reduce to make those reductions for them. And that's kind of a mouthful. So here is an example that hopefully helps explain this. So in this hypothetical situation, there's two companies, A and B, and their total carbon emissions are 15. A emits five, B emits 10. And their abatement costs are different. For A to reduce their output, of carbon dioxide by one ton, it costs 25. For B, it costs 50. So if we as a society decide that 15 tons is too much, we want to get this down to 13, reduce it by two, we have a couple of options. The first is obvious. We require A and B to each reduce by one ton, which they do, and the total cost is $75. Total carbon emissions are down to 13. 
or we can allow carbon trading. If we allow carbon trading, A, which can reduce so much cheaper than B, is gonna reduce both tons. B is not gonna reduce at all, but the total is still gonna go down to 13. Of course, A is not gonna do this for free. B is gonna have to pay A to make those reductions, and they'll pay them something more than the $25 that it costs, but something less than it would have cost B, so somewhere between $25 and $50. And this is the situation really that we're in with our cook stoves because we can reduce carbon for much cheaper than your typical factory, say a cement factory in Sweden. And so they're willing to pay us to make those reductions for them. And they do that by buying the carbon credits that we produce. And this can be done in a lot of ways. It can be a project by project basis where one company approaches a carbon or a cook stove development group and puts together this project or because carbon trading has grown and become such a widespread global phenomenon, there's actually market exchanges where this buying and selling can happen now, the same way that you buy and sell socks. So people that work on cook stoves are really excited about carbon for a lot of reasons. And essentially it boils down to the fact that cook stoves are a technology that has so many different benefits. They impact health, especially for women and children. They have amazing health effects. They save very poor families money. They reduce deforestation. They do all of these great things, and carbon provides us with a new way to pay for them. So for a typical, well, for our cook stove projects, uh, as Ashok mentioned, our stove costs about $25 to produce and to get into the hands of people in Ethiopia. This is obviously too much for a family in Ethiopia to pay. They cannot afford $25 for a cook stove. So typically in the past, what would have been done is that an organization would have raised money through donations or grants to cover a subsidization or, or pay for the entire cost of that stove. But carbon allows us a totally new option. So applying for carbon has its own costs. Putting together these projects is actually very expensive. You have to monitor, you have to verify. Uh, there's a whole host of costs associated with applying and running these carbon projects. Here I've just estimated it at about $10 per stove, bringing our per stove cost up to $35. But in terms of revenue, if we have two carbon credits per year, and carbon credits last time I checked were selling for about $16 on the European exchange, we can actually make $32 just by selling the carbon credits. So that reduces the cost to the consumer to $3, which is much more reasonable, is something that a family in Ethiopia could conceivably pay for one of these cook stoves. So the thing that really gets cook stove people excited about carbon is that we have a way to make these very, very beneficial technologies affordable for the people that need them. And that's just in the first year. So if this essentially pays off all of the costs within one year, but they keep producing carbon credits over their lifetime, which we think is about four years, then each of these stoves is gonna to continue to make profit for the next four years, over $100, round numbers. So that's the other part of carbon that has people really excited, that there's potentially this huge profit that's involved. And depending on how the projects are structured, that profit can be split up in a lot of different ways. Often there's an investor that put money in to begin with, so you have to pay them off. Um, sometimes the community that these cook stoves are in get a cut of that money that they can use for other sorts of development projects. And some of this money, we hope, comes back to places like LBL and organizations that are developing these energy efficient technologies so that they can continue to improve. One caveat in this, this number here is that this is really sort of an ideal projection. Um, in the few years that we've had of cook stoves and carbon projects, we've seen that actually it's pretty rare to get uh, these kind of numbers. And part of the reason is that these costs have been much larger than anybody ever thought that they would be. It's usually a few hundred thousand dollars to put together one of these carbon projects. Um, the transaction costs are incredibly high. The other reason is that stoves haven't performed the way that people thought they would. The difference between testing in the lab and how things perform in the field tends to be pretty different. And so if we want to get to this ideal number, we actually have a lot of work to do. So there's a lot of people that are working on the policy end of things, trying to reduce the costs, make these more friendly towards cook stove projects. 
And there's people like Ashok in our group that are working on the technology end, trying to make sure that stoves continue to be more efficient, last longer, and cost less. And with that, I'll turn it back over to Ashok. Oh, sorry to Jeff. Go, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. So we're going to have uh, voting time again. So get your cell phones out. Okay, so do you think carbon trading will curb climate change? Again, text in 22333. Uh, yes is 124344. Four. A no is 124. Three, four, three. So let's see how we do. Okay. And no, oh, here come the nose. Oh, it's a horse race now. Oh. Oh, skepticism reigns. Cage, I don't know. I think you have to come back up here and redo your presentation. Well, oh, okay. They liked you after all. Okay, well, something fun. Uh, Shok's going to finish off, and then we're going to go to our Q&A session. So current status, uh, current status of, of the various projects that we mentioned, so you saw that a Berkeley Ethiopia stove has tested well in the lab using the international standard water boiling test. It does equal to or better than the other stoves that were tested using the same standard international water boiling test by World Vision in Ethiopia. Uh, now that this testing is done, 20 of the Berkeley Ethiopia stoves were built in Mumbai they're flown to Addis Ababa in June. And now they are being field tested by rural Ethiopian women. And we expect to hear back the results of that testing uh, either later this week or sometime next week. So we'll get an idea of where World Vision wants to go with this. 3,000 of the Berkeley Darfur stoves have been built and distributed in Darfur since October of last year, and the shipment of the next 6,000 flat kits, and you'll, you'll read more about it if you go to the website, come to that in a second. So the next 6,000 flat kits has arrived in Port Sudan, and is on the way to Darfur for assembly and distribution to Darfur refugee women. So we literally already have a few thousand stoves, and we'll get to 10,000 stoves very soon. We expect to be able to distribute several thousand stoves every year um, now onwards in cooperation. This work in Darfur is in cooperation with Oxfam America. They are the partners with Boots on the Ground. So in response to uh, the push to have financial flows go to the cheapest way to reduce carbon dioxide, the world community has created a new commodity which is abbreviatedly called carbon, but actually it is carbon emission offsets, okay? So carbon is a new commodity that's being traded, and that trade permits the financial flows to go to the cheapest option, to the cheapest bidder, to reduce CO2 emissions, assuming that is being verified in a transparent and authentic way, and that is built into that mechanism. Uh, the carbon trade will actually need to rise to rise very rapidly because we don't have much time. Uh, in a few years, it needs to write, rise to hundreds of billions of dollars annually, uh, maybe close to a trillion dollars. And the largest carbon trading market, London, already is trading tens of billions of dollars every year because Europe signed on to Kyoto, they, they started European emissions trading schemes, and they're already up to speed and running, and New York Stock Exchange is trying to catch up. Now they just, I think last week, they, they made their first move to try to get into the carbon market. 
Lastly, valid ethical concerns remain about carbon trading that need to be addressed honestly with transparency and, and listening to genuine concerns that are being expressed by both the skeptics and opponents of carbon trading. I'll just mention two of the ethical concerns that have been raised. One concern is uh, that effectively the wealthy countries, us, are buying off carbon offsets from the poor countries so we can continue to drive our SUVs. And that's a completely legitimate concern. Are we buying indulgences like they used to be sold in the few centuries ago? So, so you could do all kinds of funny stuff after buying them. Uh, the second objection uh, is that if the developing countries, uh, particularly the, the ones which are economically moving forward, China and India, and, and those like them, if they sell off their carbon credits uh, by saving emissions to the wealthy countries, then when the time comes for India and China to start to reduce their own carbon emissions, they would have sold off their best low-hanging fruit to the wealthy countries at the cheapest rate because they're all competing with each other. And then these poor countries would be squeezed because now they would have to do much more expensive carbon reductions because their own opportunities for carbon reduction, the cheapest ones, they had foolishly sold off to the rich countries who were smart enough to just buy these opportunities rather than reducing their own emissions. So these concerns have been raised, are being discussed, and we'll see what happens. Lastly, what can you do? What can I do individually? Okay. So three things here in three boxes. First is there is a website called Home Energy Saver that Lawrence Berkeley Lab has developed, hes.lbl.gov slash consumer, that's for us. And what it does is it takes you step by step by your zip code through details of your house, the way the house has been built and the ways in what weather it is and what size it is and how much insulation it has and what kind of windows and how much windows it has by square feet. And then it actually tells you what's the best thing you could do in terms of cost effectiveness to reduce your energy bill step by step. So it would tell you, is it better to insulate your attic even more or is it better to go from single pane to double pane windows? It would assess these benefits against each other and give you a prioritized list of what you could do to reduce your home energy consumption. The second thing is that pg and &E has a program called Climate Smart. Surprisingly and somewhat regretfully, this program and their website is just www.pge.com slash climate smart. Only 40,000 people have signed up with this. What, what this program does is it allows you to entirely offset your own pg and &E energy bill in terms of carbon credits. Those carbon credits are not purchased from developing countries. They're, they're, all, they're all being uh, obtained by forestry plantations in the United States by a third party a forestry group that is being verified independently by a fourth group. So now you have extra certification. You have not gone outside the boundaries of pg &E. You have really offset all your carbon dioxide emissions for your house. I did it for, for my house, for example, and my pg and &E bill went up by $6 per month, and therefore I can feel good about being a carbon-free household in terms of at least the pg and &E, uh, energy that I use. And then lastly, to get to know more about and support the Darfur Stowe's work, because it's indeed for the women and girls refugees in Darfur, and it is indeed uh, a charitable effort. The website for that project is darfurstoves.org. And as you saw earlier, this is a donation of the stoves that we make with Oxfam America to help reduce the hardship and the risk of rape and mutilation for the women and girls in Darfur refugee camps. So with that, I would like to close.
and open the floor for questions. Jeff, you would like to.